Hey, good morning. It's 8.25 a.m. It is Sunday morning. It is February 25th. There's something about today that makes me think about a time in my life when I was younger living with my my mother. I was thinking about my mother this morning. It's sometimes like, you know, if the sun is shining in a certain direction or the lighting kind of brings me back to another time where it was similar, it felt similar, you know. And I guess I was just thinking about, um, you know, my relationship with my mother. Um, I'm referring to my, of course, adopted mother, the one that I've actually known, you know. And I was thinking about, you know, on Sundays because, um, you know, Sundays were kind of a big deal in our family when when I was really young. Uh, We had a traditional family breakfast breakfast. you know, with um, whatever, like my dad would be the one who would do most of the cooking, and you know, uh, we would meet up and and have you know each person in the family would be responsible for making something. Whether that be, I might have been the one who made toast, and my sister might have been the one who prepared the juice for the morning or something. You know, this is what we used to do, and I actually enjoyed that time with my my fake family. Of course, you know, I was really young at the time and things weren't getting rocky when it came to you know any harassment issues I was getting bullied at school at the time I remember Sundays were my day of dread okay but as far as it affecting the family dynamic um, other than my mom you know my mom always had issues with me but during this particular these years I would say first grade through third grade my mom and my seemed to be getting along you know with the, of course, the exceptional, my mother would fly off the handle if, if I did something wrong, okay? But, you know, uh, there were times where, you know, we spent together, like, we would be baking together, we would laugh together, we would sometimes even draw together. Um, so there were times where I got along okay with my mother. Um, but I was thinking about, you know, d- during those Sundays, how I felt, um, you know, feeling like I had a family, you know, and it's, it's, I think the tragedy in this, right, is finding out that all of this was fake, you know, and I, you know, even the, the good memories that I had, of, of, I think, of course, what made the memories important and special is because, you know, I, I really imp- appreciated the time that my dad took to spend time with us. I think he really made a, a big effort to be a good um, father especially when I think about the early years, the early years of him getting up in the morning, um, making us breakfast. You know, sometimes he would come in my room and um, we would just talk, you know. He would come in, uh, my sister would be sleeping, and my my bed faced the, the hallway, so he would just come in. And then, you know, I would, like, make, he would make my stuffed animals talk, but I would have to say that my mom did a better job. <laughs> At pretending, playing those pretend games. And then we'd go into the kitchen and, you know, um, my dad would, you know, start making breakfast. And I was always hanging around my dad, always, you know. And I just felt so happy, you know. But Sunday was always that dread for me because I knew I was going to have to go to school and deal with kids teasing me and stuff like that. But um, but I would try to make the best of that during the daytime, okay? So I know that in that, those years, my parents were sending us to a, a church. Um, it was called Olivet Baptist Church, right? And Olivet Baptist Church it no longer exists, okay? But um, we would go on this bus. They would take us on a bus, and we would go and, you know... Um, draw pictures of Jesus and then have snacks in the afternoon because we went to the kids section okay and I did mention that I wanted to see you know people get baptized and stuff like that so I did remember going into the main church and um, seeing the adult you know being in the adult service okay I do remember doing that but um, and and when I do we come home and you know I just remember playing in the backyard in 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 those days and then having a crush on the boy that lived around the corner from me, um, which I still communicate with. He he contacts me every once in a while, which is cool. You know, um, it's nice to have some roots. Like I don't have roots. Like I I I've, I know people here in this community. 
they talk about, hey, you know, we went to school together and they still have this great relationship. And that's having roots. That's having stability. It's having someone that you recognize from a long period of time of your life that you shared time with, that you have a connection with. I, ha I don't have very much of that. You know what I mean? Um, because obviously I don't have a family. I can't tell you how devastating something like this is. It's like, oh my God, this was all the biggest mind fuck that anybody could ever deal with, you know. But the beautiful memories of Sunday, I just remember, you know, coming home and we would play be baseball in the backyard. Um, of course, we, we couldn't use, we had a baseball, okay, but we couldn't use the baseball because we were afraid of, you know, my parents were always warning us that if we broke the window, somebody's window, <laughs> we would get in trouble and we just couldn't. So I remember it was like taking aluminum foil wrapping up a okay this huge ball and using that right <laughs> and I just but we had fun you know what I mean it was a fun time for for us and I remember those times when we did go to Sunday school making um arts and crafts and making arts and crafts for um Mother's Day now Mother's Day is not right now I mean that's a few months ahead of now but Looking back, you know, I remember being excited about making my mom this recipe holder, you know, that we were making in Sunday school, and I was so excited to give it to her, and she seemed happy to get it. Like, she didn't, it didn't seem fake, okay, and you know, I can read into things. I know that there were times that me and my mom did get along, but like I said, you know, as you get older and the targeting increases and there's more pressure on the family and then things were going on, my, it, it just, I, I can't tell you the kind of shit that, that ruined. I think things could have been okay in, until it got to a certain point, you know what I mean? But um, I was also thinking about, you know, at Sunday night, you know, we would watch, um, you know, I think it was called The Wonderful World of Disney. And during that time, that's when the anxiety would start. I would start feeling the major anxiety, the dread of having to go to school. But what I did look forward to going to school, I loved learning. I loved that, okay? And I loved uh, our reading assignments when we were kids. And I also loved, um, you know, my first grade teacher. I thought she was fascinating. And she was the first person that I ever recall seeing pregnant. You know what I mean? I, as a kid, you know, we weren't really around too many people. And um, she had a baby that year. And it intrigued me because, like I said, she was the first person that I ever saw carry a baby, you know. And we, we she we announced that she was going to have a kid. And as time progressed, you know, I saw the baby grow inside of her. And it just, like, intrigued me, you know. Because it was a special moment for me, you know. It was kind of cool, you know. And, of course, seeing your kid, you, you start thinking, what's it going to be like when I have a kid? But I think my favorite teacher um, that I ever had in school was Mrs. Schamberger. I, you know, Mrs. Schamberger, to me, was, like, the best teacher. I had her in, um, oh, God. After kindergarten, my mom, you know, she really didn't like us hanging around in the house a lot, right? So she sent us to summer school one year. And we went to summer school, and Mrs. Schaumberger was my, my summer school teacher that year. And I loved her immediately. Why? Because she wasn't just a teacher of the regular curriculum. She was also a teacher when it came to other activities and, you know, expressing um, you know, the little childhood desires and things like that. She knew how to cater to that. And also she had a piano in her room, right? Um, which was awesome because she would play and I loved singing when I was a kid. So I just loved, I loved her creativity that she brought into the school system. So when I got her for sixth grade, I was just so excited like, I, that was the, one of the best years I had in my elementary years. I was excited to go to school every day, and I did not care if the kids were bullying me because I remember Ms. Schamberg would stand up for me a lot. She was just like, you know, Maria, is just, you're just an individual. That's what you are. Even I remember kids picking on me about me being so different than everyone else. I thought Ms. Schamberg at least understood me. I, I thought she was a great teacher, you know. And also, I remember... When I was a kid, um, my mom would do my hair, and um, my mom was really practical. Like, she never, she always made use of things that most people would throw away. And this comes from her growing up in poverty, okay? Obviously, 
people like that, they did that. They did that stuff to get by. <laughs> they did. And it's funny because as an adult, I'm kind of the same way, even though... Like, there were times when I was working, I could have just went out and bought, like, one of those nice little utensil holders at, um, I don't know, you know, one of the department stores. But I chose to make my own instead. So I took a coffee can and put, like, you know, some fabric around it and decorated it and made it my own. That's how I am. But see, my mom didn't even decorate stuff. She was like, oh, this Weiler's can, you know, this instant lemonade can. <laughs> That was empty. She's like, I'll put all your barrettes in there. And what pissed me off about it is because I'm like super feminine, right? I wanted a pretty jewelry box or something nice to organize my barrettes. But she kept it in the Weiler's can. Whatever, okay? So I remember she would do my hair in the morning. And I just remember how happy I would be because we would listen to the radio. And when I would hear Mr. Blue Sky come on in the, on the radio, it just made my, my day. Like, I love that song. And I would be singing it, humming it, thinking it all the way to school. You know, what a happy time. Those were happy times, you know what I mean? And I, I, I kind of think they're precious. So I got up this morning, and, um, of course, that's what I was thinking about. You know, the whole fake family, the whole weird reality. Even the good memories, it's like, it's sad because it's like all that just gets yanked away from you like man like I said it this is like the, one of the most heartbreaking things you could ever experience it is extremely heartbreaking but um yeah there were there were good times at, at, at my in my family and I do think that had we had not been targeted um as strong um as we we did I think it could have been a decent decent family because I remember even my brother back then we were getting along even though he did he he was always bullying mind you he was always a bullying type person like we would be in the in the um um the room where we were wa watching tv and if you know I'm the kind of person I need to move my feet or something I, I can't just sit still okay so I'm the kind of person I'll kind of like jitter my my legs because I'm like man I, I'm always thinking right and he that would annoy him you know what I mean? Um, he would throw books at me. Um, he would spit in my food. He, he would just do shit that, you know, it's like, you, you know, he, he was an asshole, you know, basically. But there were still times where we got along. Like, we would go um, to the store together. Um, we would go to the parks and stuff like that together. Um, going out and catching lizards and stuff like that. We would do that sort of stuff together. Um, I think, I don't know at what point things got so sick where everybody just like turned on each other to the where it was a point of where it was just beyond normal. Like, you know, this so much thick animosity that, you know, I wasn't even really aware of that went on. I just kind of, like I said, excused it as that's just your typical older brother being a, a dick, right? That's what I was thinking. But it was deeper than that, you know. But anyway, yeah, so I'm trying to, like, divert my attention a lot from dealing with my issues at the moment. I have not been online yet. I don't, I'm still dealing with those anxiety issues. I hate dealing with my issues because it does cause me a lot of trauma. You know what I mean? Obviously, um, people can tell that I've dealt with this issue for a very, very long time, even though I didn't know what was going on at the time. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about you know, the periods of time uh, where things were decent within my family unit. I mean, and like I said, there was always some little outbreak of, you know, um, maybe a disagreement. That's normal, okay? But, like, where it was just, like, people just fucking had zero regard for me. Like, you know, my sister just started turning on me, and slowly but surely it just got weirder and weirder and weirder. weirder. So, um, you know... I, I've been um, a victim of this for, for quite a long time. And so um, I try to hang on to the positive memories as much as I possibly can, you know. Um, I know, like, certain things remind me of that. You know, like, I can't have um, certain things in my life, you know. Like, I can't have a garden, okay. Um, I do have, like, some little potted plants in the backyard, Um in my back patio, it's not even a yard, but anyway, <laughs> I can't do that, you know, but I try to relive the, the good moments that I had, and most of the moments um, that I had were generally by myself, you know what I mean, um, 
But I did have some decent moments with my family. The day that I gave my mom the little gift that I made her from for Mother's Day, that was a good day. You know what I mean? And I used to love being in the garden with my mom and, and my dad. And I know that my dad was really good at gardening. He could grow anything. And I do remember um, growing some, what do you call it? Um, pe- not peas, but... God, I have some of these in the refrigerator. What are they? String beans. Beans, right? Beans. We we planted beans um, in in kindergarten. No, was it kindergarten or first grade? I think it was. I think it was first grade, maybe. Anyway, we planted these little plants, like, and it was very small. And we it started off in the classroom, and then we got to take them home. And then my dad was like, you know, he put them in the ground. And um, I was all excited because that was something that I made or I planted myself and it started to grow. And my dad was tending it. And then, of course, when, when it got big, we, we would eat the, the um, we ate the uh, beans that grew off of it. And I was so proud of myself. And I knew from that point on, it's like I, I definitely want to get into planting and stuff like that. And that's something that's important to me. I would love to be able to grow my own vegetables and fruit you know I mean I I would prefer to do that kind of live off the land type thing it would be kind of cool actually you know what I mean but no I mean living in the Gordon family wasn't all bad but it did turn extremely toxic at, at certain times you know what I mean and then of course it progressed into you know what it did and it it was it was it was pretty sad thing it all happened like that but and like I said you know where does the emotional attachment lie because it's like these people weren't even my family it was all a setup and you wonder you know are these people just good actors or you know I, I don't know I don't know it just leaves you with so much you know a lot of pain I guess is what you feel so anyway um what else did I want to say really quick? Hey, I'm making this a, a very cordial video. I'm just sharing something. And mind you, you should be very glad that I'm not taking any jabs at anybody right now. Because God knows I have the right to. But I understand that it's getting a little old. Okay, I'm not somebody who likes to go on and on and on about stuff. But you have to understand, these are the only experiences and things that have happened to me that I have to wallow in. Because there's not a lot of opportunities to have new experiences. I can't go out and do anything because I'm not making any money right now. Okay. You see what this hold up is and the kind of control over my life is what these people have. And it's, it's improper. You know what I mean? And I have the right to say that. I mean, of course, I understand there's certain important people who, who feel like. But this is why our people cry out injustices is when they start reflecting on laws and their rights and stuff like that. It's understandable that I, I feel the way ow, I feel the way that I do, you know. Um, I also want to say something about um, the thought that I had about adding more to to this issue of the workplace. I was gonna make a video on my computer with like a diagram of of like employment <laughs> of employment practices. You know what I mean? And I can think, okay, I'm not in the work sector anymore, but. Um, you know, I, I honestly, I can see um, a lot of discontentment in people's lives. And I do understand that the root cause of it is because, you know, people basically have been reduced to a form of slavery um, when it comes to the, the work environment, which is dangerous, okay? Because, like I said, contentment within the work, uh, your work life is extremely, extremely important. It cannot be ignored. Like people literally have to have good matches in their job, okay? And I know there's a lot there's a lot of complexities when it comes to matches. You know what I mean? Like, um, what do you call it? Um, chemistry, you know, because there's some, like, for example, if you have an office of, like, 10 people, that's 10 different personalities that have to mesh well. Okay, so you're dealing with different personalities, you're dealing with different backgrounds, you're dealing with so many different things, but really at the, at the core of it, what people want to do is they want to find contentment, okay, and the contentment lies in having their flexibility, having their choices, and what is in harmony with them as an individual, that's what matters, okay. Of course, that varies for each person, but this is where you define your company culture. This is where you say, hey, this is what we're all about, so you know how to attract the right people. The right people 
will gravitate to the, the kind of values that, that are shared, you know what I mean? So I was given the example of how I used to like Hot Topic. That was, a, you know, back in the 90s, okay? Because if you liked anything weird, anything odd, anything a little bit different, you know, you could find that at a Hot Topic. Plus, you could also get a lot of cute stuff, too, because I did have Hello Kitty and stuff like that. But it was, it was something that appealed to the young heart, right? And, of course, the employees reflected that, you know what I mean? And some people, um, you know, there's a lot of artistic people who, when they hit adult years, they have a very difficult time having to fit in with people basically badgering them. Hey, you know, you need to get rid of the piercings. You need to get rid of it. And so they gravitate. They, they don't want to. Now, some people, I, I, they, they're just tired of their own piercings. They're tired of their tattoos. So they choose to remove them, and they, they, they choose to do that. You know what I mean? Because they, they have either outgrown it, they've experienced something they no longer want to be in that, that, that lifestyle, and so they, they choose to step out of that. And that's fine. That's, that's how they choose to move on with the rest of their life. But there are some people who choose to be in that lifestyle still. And they, they, in their 40s, 50s, it may seem absurd to some people, but this is what gives them their life force. This is their drive. Okay, so let you take this maybe like 40-something-year-old person who has been working in like, you know, I would say places like Hot Topic, retail or whatever. It gives them the opportunity to move up into different positions. Somebody like that would be very happy working in a place like Hot Topic, managing a store like that. Of course, if that is, of course, they have management skills, okay, and that sort of stuff. But I'm just saying is people need to be fit for what it is that they're doing. That number one, okay? And when people are content with that, a lot of the tension would lessen. I'm not saying it would be eliminated completely because people are going to bring their draw bones and shit like that. But at least that base, that particular important foundation is already set. The contentment of knowing that they have a match, at least when it comes to their values and how they conduct themselves every day because it's in harmony. It's in that culture. It matches the culture. You know what I mean? And it's silly to sit here and talk about your work culture when you bring in people who don't match that culture and then try to convert them into your culture. It doesn't work that way. I know people are doing it, but I'm pointing out once again what people are doing backwards and they need to correct it because it's causing a problem. People fucking hate going to their jobs. Okay, and it's so funny because I've been watching some little... Um, clips on Facebook. I don't know this person's name, and really it's important for me to, to come up with this person's name because I think their work is clever. It's like these little scenarios, and it, it, you know, the artwork is very basic. It looks like, it, you know, they look kind of like stick people, but the point is, is that, um, you know, they're making fun of these scenarios that literally go, that most people can relate to that go on in the workplace, right? It's a good way of this particular artist to let out these sort of frustrations that so many other people can relate to. You know what I mean? Um, you, sometimes you have to look at it in, in, in a way that's humorous, okay? But we all know that sometimes humor is... What makes things funny is because it touches on the truth, okay? It touches on the truth. And these little interactions, these, these little chipping away at a person's spirit that goes on in the workplace every day. Um, it, it's good that somebody take, takes this and makes something funny out of it. Because really, it is not just, it, it is funny, but we all know how draining it really is. How it's affecting our daily lives, you know what I mean? So I think it's positive that she, I think the girl created this and I'm, I'm, I'm one day I'll follow up and maybe put a clip of their video so you know who I'm talking about because I don't remember but and like I said I should because I think that kind of work is important it's important to re to express exactly what is going on and how it's making people feel you know what I mean and hopefully you know businesses will start picking up on this you know what what would people really need in order to have a better functioning um work culture because this is not working it's not working you people being matched or forced into jobs as some sort of what do you call it re-education camp um because that's what it seems like you know what i mean you you can't take somebody who who um who has an artistic flair and expect them to you know 
gravitate towards eliminating that. Like, for example, um, the issue with my clothes, right? Like I said, my, your, my clothes are me. Me, my clothes, my clothes are me. I am identified by my clothes. It is a part of my identity. It's who I am. It's who I love. It's what I care about. It, it's That's not a fucking lie, okay? Right when I was a teenager, what Maria worked for when she was a kid, her fucking clothes, okay? My clothes. <laughs> I fucking... And I and some people say, well, you're fifty something years. You should be directing your attention. So don't tell me how to direct my attention. My attention is based on you know a lot of what I've had to experience, and it, it is what it is. And you know this is what I gravitate to. And as I get older, you know um, that's I don't plan on changing that because I I live to support my lifestyle, which is what everybody chooses to do. But unfortunately, because of the trafficking system. People are being diverted into certain things that they don't want, and people are living their lives as slaves. Human trafficking is a huge problem, okay? Because like I said, no such thing as work-life work balance under that system. You know, I mean, the system's supposed to be open. It's supposed to be fair and just, you know? And I remember what I liked about Edwards Air Force Base, not so much Edwards Air Force Base, but you know, the, the reading material that I got to, that I used, I got to pilfer. I was very glad to get it. Um, the reason why I was supposed to be pilfered is because, you know, usually they shred that material, but I was like, you know what, I want to keep this. I'm going to read this. And I read it and it was good. It was very good information because employment is supposed to be <clears throat> um, an open opportunity for everyone. Okay. Like I said, people can have their advantages there's nothing wrong with having a network, but the network should be working within those guidelines. Otherwise, you're setting a person up in a form of slavery. That's what human trafficking is, because it's a denying a person a right to seek out their employment, to be able to pursue their life, or what do you call it, the pursuit of happiness or whatever. It, it's, it's, it's unfair to, um, you know, to use employment as a form of maybe even some sort of punishment or some sort of restriction or some something because that's under coercion that would fall under those guidelines um, when I talk about human trafficking this is what the, the 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 difference between having a job and working as like an indentured servant you know what I mean it's it's slavery human trafficking is definitely slavery so anyway, and you know, like I said, you don't have to be a person of color to be in it. There's a lot of people who are associated with certain networks that are, are doing this to them, and they may not be aware of it. Like I said, think back, start thinking about all the coincidences, the little kawinky dinks that have been going on in your life. You're like, oh, shit, you know? And, and when you start realizing that, you know, you, you're, you're struggling to get out of these situations, right? Um, and then you start realizing how, how taxing it is and uh, the impossible situation. I remember when I was working at my last job, and this sounds like a very d dark thought, okay, but, you know, when we live in, when people set up these dystopian type weird situations, you know, people think, my goodness, this is a very bleak existence that I'm having. My, my life is worthless. I don't care about anything. Nothing matters to me anymore. Like, you know, you're taking away things that I care about and you're forcing me to work a job that I don't fucking want to be at. I don't want to be here. You know what I mean? And then I, not only do I not want to be here, I'm being stripped of things that I care about in my personal life because I'm being monitored. If I go out for a walk, people are talking shit about that. Blah, 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 blah. Then I kept thinking, okay, if this is how the system is, why don't they just be fair? Why don't they just be fair and... And I now don't don't get triggered by me saying this, okay? But I get thinking, why don't you just set up euthanization camps so that people can, you know, just go ahead and just fucking end their life because their life is worthless at this point. Why should you force somebody to live a life like this? It's a nightmare. It's a fucking nightmare. You know what I mean? And I that's what I was thinking, you know. And it's an it's an honest thought because people should not have to live in a state of drudgery every single day they shouldn't have to fear going to work and being triggered or being you know bullied into something that they don't want they don't want it you know what i mean um people need to have a better set foundation and the way to have that foundation is to be set in the right job according to what your personality is what it is that you personally like what is it your personal needs 
to match whatever company's vision or whatever. It should make sense. Don't drag people into places that they should not be in. You know, it's not good for the, for you, the employer, and it's not good for the employee. Okay, like I said, you know, when people get to the point where they feel like they don't have any other way out, you know, they start acting out. You know what I mean? And you get people too so much to the point of misery. Yeah, they're going to think about suicide. They, well, what, they, what good is your fucking life? Your life is useless. It's pointless. There is no reason for you to fucking be here. And no, I'm not saying kill yourself. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is, you know, the shit that people do is um, in, in human trafficking and how it denies a person the right to live in the way that they want to. And then they, they resent, you know, having to support a, um, a system that they, they, they don't believe in. You know what I mean? And I know um, I was talking about how people acted out, like the guy who pissed in, in, somebody's, in the coffee or whatever, and people spit in people's food all the time. You know what I mean? Because um, that, they, they feel that's the least that they can do. They feel helpless. You know, it's not like they can go out and find a job that they really want because somebody's blocking them. You know what I mean? Um, so basically, they're stuck to exist in a very limited way of living. And so, like I said, why would you make somebody suffer? Why don't you just fucking kill them? That's what I'm saying. It's like, that's a, it's a slow fucking kill is what it is. Slow kill. That's what it is. Um, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how much human trafficking takes out of a person's life. So anyway... I think that's all I want to say today. I, like I said, I'm not getting on my computer right now. I do want to finish my video, though. My um, video that I'm doing on the plants of the mind. And I hope you guys tune into that. Um, and I do hope that you guys will, anger, you know, um, support me on Patreon. Uh, there are so many things <clears throat> that I really want to do on Patreon. And I'm looking forward to, to showing and presenting. And, you know, it's, it's a part of my work-life balance. Okay? And on, uh, I, just like on my videos... Um, whether I'm on YouTube or I'm on Patreon or whatever, this is, this is me. This is who I am. You know, it's not an altered version of me. It's not a, uh, what do you call it? It is 100% me. No, no fucking restriction. You know what I mean? Um, no sacrifices, meaning like the, the fact that, um, I, you know, I don't know, like when I, when I got uh, these jobs, right, the way they try to chip you down and they think that, you have to grovel and make sacrifices so that you can survive, okay? First of all, they want you to give up something that you care about in order to obtain something else. That makes no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. You know what I mean? Like, that right there is step into my hamster wheel. Step into my hamster wheel. Because I'm basically giving up everything I care about so I can sit here and work a job that does, feel, fills me absolutely no way. Some people are, well, you know, you got a roof over your head and you got, you know, you got clothes on your back. What good are my clothes? My clothes have been sitting in my closet, which pissed me off because, you know, I have a great slack collection. I love my slacks. My slacks are not ready to be retired. They are not. So, you know, like I said, hey, you know what? My clothes are here. I'm going to wear them the only time I go out of the house. And I choose my little outfits wisely when I do go out because my world is important to me. And people need to find the jobs that support their world, whatever that might be. So, like I said, if people like, um, somebody likes aerospace. Some people like, you know, th like things like, um, what do you call it, aerospace, but aviation or whatever. Like the job somebody picked out for me recently, and I, I don't know, a few months ago. Um, some people like that. I, I don't. I don't like anything that's bland. I don't like anything that's boring. I don't like anything that's not girly. Or anything that's not mystical, or anything that's not going to blow my mind. That I I don't. Okay, so bad match, right? And the attitude of a person who is stuck in an environment, like for example, another job I wouldn't want. I wouldn't want to work in an auto parts store. I don't care about auto parts. I know I've needed auto parts, and I'll tell you when I need my car fixed or whatever, I rarely wait around. If if I have to. I'll go get a bowl of soup at a Mexican restaurant or something if I have to get my coil changed or um, if I have to go to like a place like Pet Boys or something for auto part, I get the auto part and I get the fuck out. 
I'm not sitting here, with, you know, just, you know, checking it out, walking down the aisle, interested in the merchandise. I don't care about that stuff. I understand there's a necessity for it. Obviously, it's a needed thing, but I don't want to be there. So here, you know, you get these people with these ideas, well, we'll put her here. No, it should not work like that. You know what I mean? I was thinking it would be great if, if, if people, like, for example, an employment agency would compile information on, you know, the particular candidate that they're looking for, as well as match it to the employer. And I think, like, for example, you're a person, like, who works in accounting, for example, and you also, your hobbies are, I like art, I like um, sewing, I like whatever. So when they look at the database, they're like, okay, well, this particular company, they need, you know, somebody, um, like, for example, um, a sewing machine company or something. You know, they, they're looking for a bookkeeper, right? And they would say, oh, Maria, she's, she's a bookkeeper, and she's, you know, she's, she's been, she likes art. You know, she likes sewing. You know, I think she would be a good candidate. You know, th that sort of stuff. Because it's like, you're in the industry that you're in, it really does matter. It really, really does matter. So anyway, I think I've been rambling on enough. Um, I do want to get on with my day and make my video. I will say the coffee that I'm drinking, again, tastes extremely good right now. And I'm happy to be drinking it. <laughs> you know, you, sometimes you have to sit here and, like, cherish the most precious moments however small they are and this coffee right now is really making me happy i'm going to wrap up this video i will have another video sometime later hey and thank you for listening to my little you know going down memory lane i know it's not anything major but hey at least i'm getting off the subject of taking jabs at pyramid boy and all this other stuff so we don't need to go there anyway wrap this video up talk to you later Bye bye